In this podcast, I want to give you an overview of what to expect when you study the biopsychology chapter in an intro to psychology course. Uh, at the graduate level, a course like this would actually be called Biological Basis of Behavior, and I think that explains it very well. It's a particular perspective to examine our human behavior in terms of what affects our mind and our actions based in biology, right? How does our biology create and affect our behavior. Okay. And let me give you a typical outline of what you'd expect in this kind of course. And and we're going to go from uh, micro to a little bit macro in terms of biology. So we'll start at the genetic level and then move up to the cellular level, studying the actual neuron, the anatomy of it. Uh, and also it's important to pay attention to both the chemical processes of the neuron and the electrical processes uh, that's happening uh, within the neuron. So when you hear of uh, the biochemistry and chemicals within the brain, these are being emitted and transferred in between neurons. When you hear about the electrical process that's happening in our brain, that refers to the electrical activity that's happening within each neuron. Okay, and, and those are two different things. Um, and so when you're talking about the electrical process, there are a couple of important terms that you should know, and that is the action and resting potential. And the word potential here doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean what could happen. Potential here is actually another word from, let's say, uh, electrical engineering or electronics or physics that refers to the voltage level. Okay, the amount of electrical activity. So that's what potential means here. So the action potential is the amount of electrical activity that's going through a single neuron, or we'll call nerve cell, at the time it's being activated. So if you imagine our, a brain scan or an MRI where a portion of the brain is being lit up, right? That means there's an action potential occurring within that particular neuron. And then when a particular nerve cell or neuron is not used at that moment, not fired up, then it's at resting potential or at resting voltage, just like our car batteries have an action voltage when you're starting it up and the car is running versus the voltage level when it is perhaps running low or not being used. Okay. Um, and then this particular chapter will progress through and talk about these neurochemicals or what we call neurotransmitters and how each neurotransmitter serves one or more functions in terms of affecting our the way we feel or our memory or how we behave, affecting our movements and balance and so forth. So if you think about what we're able to do every day, whether it's maintain a conversation to be able to... Uh, read pages in a book and translate that into an image in our mind or a thought. Walking and talking at the same time, okay, being able to drive and do all the silly things we're able to do at the same time, <laughs> which seems very dangerous, it all has to do with the balance, the type of balance we have in our brain chemistry, okay, uh, whether our mood states are fluctuating, whether we're in a flat mood, whether we feel good, whether we feel down, a lot of these emotions that we feel, our mood is affected by our biochemistry, whether we have an, a neurotransmitter that's producing too much, a neurotransmitter that's not producing enough. Just to give you one example, our brain produces a neurotransmitter called endorphins. This is basically our own uh, in-house pharmacy that is producing morphine, okay? It's a narcotic. It's, it's in the category of a painkiller, right? That's typically highly a highly controlled substance or even illegal on the street, but yet our brain produces it. Um, when I was teaching in the classroom, I would just tell my students, of course, I like to joke around and all that, but uh, I'd imagine a scenario when if I was younger and someone approached me and wanted to sell me drugs, I would just say in a nerdy fashion, no thanks, I already produced my own, right? <laughs> Which would might confuse people. It's like, well, is he cooking meth in his uh, house? No, 
uh, my brain has the ability to produce, produce its own. Okay, so we may have to uh, be exposed to certain things to do certain activities for that rush to occur. Um, otherwise, it, it it may be when it's flat, we don't feel it. Okay, so. Uh, whether we experience certain types of highs and lows depends on the production level and uh, and oftentimes when we get injured right at that moment that peak injury level sometimes we don't experience a lot of pain even though we may have broken a bone or or have some sort of uh, car accident and and we think back and we don't remember feeling much pain and that's because at the time of the injury our body produced a rush of endorphins that helped kill the pain as if we were injected with morphine okay and then of course when that wears off we start to feel the pain and if you think about what our pain signals mean right everything that we're perceiving happens in the brain right even though the injury may take part in a different part of the body this has to do uh, with our nervous system right so the central nervous system is our brain and spinal column and everything outside of that is called the peripheral nervous system, our periphery, right? So the fact that I might uh, be cooking and I burn my finger, the pain is not located in my finger. The pain is experienced in my brain, but it's transmitted via nerves. And these are just a series of elongated neurons, if you will, right? Sending that pain signal all the way to my brain, fires up a neurotransmitter, um, that tells me that in a particular part of my brain that I have pain located in this area of my hand, okay? And then if you think about the reflex, which is also talked about in this chapter, is very cool in the sense that our reflexes happen without our brain's direct involvement. There is a feedback loop, okay, called a basic reflex where the pain is experienced, let's say again in the hand, the signal is sent, toward the spinal cord, it makes a quick U-turn back toward the finger to make a twitch, right? Using a set of different neurons, which you'll, you'll read about in the textbook, okay? One, is, one type of neuron senses the pain, another type of neuron sends the signal to another neuron, which is forces our muscles to twitch, uh, okay? All right, so you'll read about those three types of neurons. And then a signal is sent momentarily later to our brain just to let us know that, hey, you experience pain in your left index finger, right? And, uh, but the fact, but the knee-jerk reaction of the reflex actually happens before our conscious awareness, right? So technically speaking, you could be semi-conscious, slightly burn your hand on a so hard surface, your hand may twitch, before you're consciously aware that you did that. So we do not need our conscious awareness. This is not a conscious act to twitch away from the heat. Our body does that for us so as a protective mechanism. Think about it, if we're cooking and our hand touches something hot and, and we have to wait for that reaction time for our brain to consciously realize we touched something hot and then we have to consciously think about our hand and consciously send a signal to move it Right, and then we would be full of scars <laughs> by now. Okay, and then in this biopsychology chapter, in addition to neurons and talking about the nervous system, of course, we'll talk about different parts of the brain, um, separated into four different lobes, as, and as well as uh, three major sections: uh, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Right, which developmentally speaking, from the cellular level, the hindbrain is develop first and then the outer cortex level is make us more human than animal that develops later I think I'm gonna do a separate podcast and talk about zombies and how realistic some of these zombies are that we see in a popular film or TV series uh, I'm a, kind of a zombie fan and I enjoy watching them and think about well is that even remotely plausible based on what we know how the brain functions okay and I'm not gonna to go too deep into analyzing them but just using information found in an introductory to psychology course in the biopsychology chapter is there enough information there to even interpret whether or not this movie is totally out of whack or that it is possible 
that plausible <laughs> that this zombie could exist and move the way it does. All right. So that's something we'll do later. Now, that's pretty much it I want to cover. I think depending on the course you're taking, um, this chapter will go more in depth in, ter in terms of the endocrine system. Uh, I don't particularly cover that, but that has to do with how hormones affect our behavior, which obviously they do, if you think about it. And uh, that's pretty much it. Just want to give you a quick overview of what to expect in a biopsychology chapter. Okay, this is Dr. C. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.